Hello, um, as I say, I'm Chris Bibby, I'm uh, the brand of our partner here at I'm going to actually talk you through, um, I guess, a bit of a story, a bit of a journey over the last three years, uh, not just one year, but three years for the price of one, um, uh, in terms of, I guess, the, the kind of warts and all story in terms of what went on behind the scenes, <coughs> uh, in terms of the changes that we'd have to make to our business and also uh, our brand over that, over that period of time. So, um, a bit of a salutary lesson. Um, I met Jackie a couple of months ago at, a, at an event. Um, and about, yeah, and about 24 hours later, this uh, uh, arrived in my inbox saying, Chris, do you fancy uh, coming to Isbar and doing a bit of a chat? So uh, just, be, just be careful uh, who you talk to. So that's we're going to go through a little bit around uh, uh, the challenges that we're facing as a brand uh, and as an organisation and all of the... Uh, huge amount of, of commentary and criticism around uh, Wonga uh, and what do we do to try and uh, address some of that. Before we do that, I guess with any great story, uh, you've got to do a bit of character development first, so uh, I'll tell you a little bit about me. Um, uh, the bit in the middle is probably the largest part of my life. These are my two uh, children, Joseph on the right, who's six, and Hermione on the left, who's about six <coughs> months, and they take up most of my time. Uh, when I'm not looking after them, uh, I do like a bit of golf. It doesn't happen very often these days, but I do like to uh, try and do that. Um, I'm a Liverpool fan. Uh, I've got that picture on there. I think that was the last time they probably won anything, although I'm hoping that's uh, going to change uh, this season. Uh, I do like uh, a nice meal and a, a good bit of wine. And, uh, uh, and equally, if I, uh, if I have time, a good uh, crime drama would uh, be typically what you'll find me doing on a, on a weeknight. So that's a bit about me. In terms of my career, as Jackie said, I, I started <coughs> off um, my life at Dunhumby, um, famous for the sort of Tesco loyalty work. I did a lot of work with Tesco. I also sort of launched in Tesco Personal Finance when it first uh, came out to market. Um, I then moved from the sort of data and sort of CRM and, and loyalty world into the slightly more glamorous world of uh, Virgin Media, uh, where I was kind of hanging out with uh, Richard and, and Usain, so it was uh, a little bit more uh, exciting. Spent six years there uh, as part of the rebrand of Virgin Media and the kind of growth around that big uh, sort of quad play uh, proposition at the time. And then uh, into uh, the wonderful world of Barclay Card, helping them launch uh, what was their, one of their digital businesses called Bespoke Offers. Um, which was their sort of take on Groupon, matching up uh, consumers and merchants together in, in the sort of office space. And then uh, finally sort of moved on to, to Wonga three years ago. Um, I guess the question at the time was why on earth would I go to, to Wonga? Um, it was a, a fantastic opportunity. It was a huge amount being talked about Wonga at the time. This was back in 2013. Um, it was a business that was growing rapidly. There was, there was a lot going on. There was lots of international expansion going on at the time. Um, I knew then that there was definitely issues with the brand. It wasn't going to be plain sailing, but that was the exciting thing for me as a marketeer, which is how could you go to a brand that clearly had some reputational issues and try and turn it into a brand that could be trusted and respected. So why not? I like a challenge, so uh, let's, let's give it a go. Little did I know quite how bad uh, that reputation uh, would, would get. So in terms of what I'm going to talk through today, just in terms of the sense of the structure, uh, we're going to go back to 2014 when we really had to reset the business and there's a lot of work that we did to really sort of uh, change all of our underlying platforms, systems, processes, policies, the way we went about organising the business. Um, we weren't doing any advertising at this point in time, we came off air uh, whilst we really kind of fixed the fundamentals of the business. We then moved into 2015 and my job was to sort of take the brand back into market and really sort of, I guess that was our year of responsibility where we really owned up to our actions uh, and took a very different tone uh, out there into the market. And then 2016, uh, off the back of our FCA authorization, was really when we started to, I guess, try and find our voice again and get a little bit of confidence uh, back in in terms of our marketing and brand message. So, I guess before the, uh, the walls caved in, as it were, um, Wanda was a business that was growing uh, incredibly rapidly. It was founded in 2007. Um, it first went on TV in about 2010, and by 2013, um, it was a significant, a significant business. So at that point in time, at the peak, there were 800,000 payday loans being taken out every month, of which 350,000 were uh, from Wonga. So we had about 45% market share. We had 60% share of voice. Uh, so of all of the media being spent, Wonga was the, by far the dominant uh, player uh, in the market. Our revenue was about £350 million. We were lending about a billion pounds of entirely self-funded 
loan book uh, every year, uh, and we had about a 1.5 billion, uh, billion pound valuation. So we, I guess we were the first of the, the unicorns in the fintech sector uh, in, in London. But that, uh, I guess, didn't um, last that long. Uh, certainly when I joined the business, within the space of about four or five months, it was clear that the, the foundations on which the business had been built were were not entirely stable and that there were a lot of cracks appearing in the way that, that organization had been run. Yeah. Undoubtedly, when you're a business that's growing that rapidly, you don't necessarily put in place all of the kind of systems and processes that you need to run a financial services business. Um, interestingly, Errol Damelin, the founder of, of Wonga, used to pride himself on the fact that he was bringing in loads of people from, from Google and Facebook and all these other crazy organizations. Not that it's crazy, it's a crazy organization, <laughs> of course. Um, uh, uh, but funnily enough, you do actually need some financial services experience in order to run a financial services business, and, um, and that was part of the problem. So it's at that point that we were, you know, at an all-time low from a reputation perspective. If you looked on YouGov, we were so far down the bottom of the brand rank. We were the lowest ranked brand of any uh, of any brand in the country. We had two very, very uh, significant public um, issues around mistreatment of customers. The first one was around fake legal letters. Uh, the second one was around a misloaning, uh, a misloan uh, approach, which effectively was like a mini PPI. Um, every single one of those things were front page headlines. Everything that we did uh, was the front page of the Mail or the Sun. So you can clearly imagine that um, it was just huge scrutiny every every single thing that we did. We decided in our uh, ultimate uh, wisdom to take on the Archbishop of Canterbury. That's obviously something that you, uh, you definitely want to, uh, you don't want to get God on the wrong side, um, which we were, we were quite uh, happy to do that in the previous regime. And interestingly, uh, this kind of chart on the right shows that our advertising, so the much, uh, much loved, uh, in, in inverted commas, the Wongies, which is an incredibly well-recognized platform, uh, were actually turning people off. So they, they stood for everything that was wrong with the sector, not just with Wonga, but all of the ills of the category were effectively, uh, the, the, the Wongies were the sort of the lightning rod of, of everything that was wrong. So anybody that saw those adverts actually was starting to think worse of the business uh, than, than better. So it was actually kind of having a negative uh, effect for us. And so at that time we kind of faced uh, ultimately a, a perfect <coughs> storm of, of everything coming together in 2014 that we really had to address. We had to work through these big remediation programs. We had to compensate um, about 300,000 customers uh, who we mislent to. The, the FCA was then looming large over, over our sector, so they'd taken, on as, uh, taken us on as an interim permission basis, and we had to start working through with them uh, to get our full, uh, full permission. Um, that meant that then bringing in a price cap, which had a fundamental impact on the economics of the business, and, and, and also then the marketing channels that we could uh, then kind of work within. Our reputation was absolutely in tatters. And not only that, but we also had to replace most of our underlying platforms. So our lending algorithms, all of our decision, uh, decisioning platform, most of our loan management systems, all of those things all had to be changed as well. So we were trying to uh, change uh, a million different wheels as we were driving down the motorway at uh, uh, a very, very high speed. I guess uh, at that point in time, there was a lot of the, the old guard then uh, left the business, and there was a real sort of change in terms of the culture uh, and the leadership team that then were running one of them. So uh, a chap called Andy Haste came in. Uh, he was our executive chairman. He was a former CEO of Rawson Alliance. Um, big sort of heavy hitter in terms of uh, the city uh, perspective. Errol and the original founders all sort of left the business, and all the senior leadership team, most of my peer group actually, all kind of left the business. And we brought in that new leadership team with a new uh, plan to take Wonga forward and effectively run the business in a very, very different way to the way in which it would uh, have been previously run, with a view, with a view and a vision to, to make Wonga a respected part of uh, the regulated financial services part, uh, you know, part of society. Um, we had six main priorities that we wanted to kind of get through. The first one is around putting the right governance in place in the organisation. Um, just the way that all of our process and policies uh, would stand up to regulatory scrutiny. We had to address the cost of borrowing. Clearly there was a price cap in place, but we wanted to look further at that because clearly the, the APRs and the costs were the thing that were being used very much against us. We had to engage positively with stakeholders, so we had to be aware that we were part of a community, a, a part of a community of people who were in quite difficult circumstances, absolutely, and we couldn't pretend to just ignore that. And I think in the past, Wonga had quite taken a huge amount of um, 
delight in, in almost just being the bad boy of the sector, but we couldn't do that anymore. We had to engage properly with the stakeholders. That included all the regulators, all of the MPs, uh, all of the charity bodies. Oh, I'm trying to keep running. Okay, is that better? Um, Maybe oh, too early. Um, <laughs> right. Um, clearly, we had to then figure out our lending criteria. That was the you know the lifeblood of the business as a lending business is making sure you're lending to the right people. We had to review all of our customer base and make sure that we were targeting the right people, being clear on who our audience was, and also then making our marketing presentable for a, a responsible financial services business. So they were the six priorities of the business, and throughout all of 2014, that was everything that we focused on. Uh, in order to kind of get us through that authorization process. The first one was about lending to the right people. Um, any loan business, if you're not lending to the right people, particularly when you're in sub and near prime lending, that's absolutely what you've got to get right. And we fundamentally threw out everything that we've done before and kind of started again, new algorithms, new platforms, and the kind of new policies that, that kind of worked around that. That had a pretty radical effect in terms of the number of people that we were accepting into the business. Um, so from an overall basis, in terms of all loans, that's new and existing customers, we went from accepting about 77% of those to about 53%. From a new customer perspective, we now only accept about 17% of all of the applications that come into our business. So there was a huge view that one would just lend to anybody, but actually that was never the case, but we've certainly tightened that up even further uh, going forward. <coughs> and that's had a corresponding impact on our sort of on due arrears. Uh, performance, which is now kind of in kind of credit card world in terms of uh, on due uh, performance. We also had to look at the cost of the loan. So clearly, as I say, the APR was a huge issue for us. For those of you, I'm sure you're all familiar with APRs, an annualised percentage rate doesn't really work very well for a loan, which is typically taken out for about two weeks. Um, so it's kind of a slightly unfair measure for us, but definitely something that we still have to address. So we worked very hard, we brought the, uh, the total interest down to uh, sort of 0.8% a day, we reduced the transmission, fee, uh, we took the transmission fee away, we reduced the, the default fees, uh, we reduced the post interest period to about 30 days, after that there's no, no interest charged, and if any customers are in difficulty they can call in and they go immediately on a repayment arrangement and their interest is frozen. So um, ultimately most people borrowing £100 are paying about £24 back of, of, of interest. And, and it's kind of hard for a lot of people when they see that APR figure to really get down to exactly what does a warm loan cost. And that's one of the biggest perception barriers that we've faced uh, from a communication perspective. We also had to figure out and reconnect <coughs> exactly who that audience was. I think we sort of lost sight of that slightly. We did a big piece of work with Call Credit, our data bureau, to really sort of understand the proportion of people that were really going to be our target audience. Clearly there was a group of people in the, in the very, very subprime that we could no longer lend to. Uh, of all, as a result of all the regulation, they were clearly going to be unacceptable to, to lend to. So we had to cut out an enormous part of our previous audience. Um, and then there's a whole group of people who are prime market lenders who we you know, clearly wouldn't, wouldn't be talking to. But it actually left about 13 million cash and credit constrained adults in the UK who are underserved by traditional financial institutions who are still in need of credit and have nowhere to turn when potentially things uh, are getting difficult for them. And it's a very real and, and very sort of significant part of, uh, of UK society. So we definitely feel like there is a demand out there. It's about being servicing that demand in the right way and not exploiting that demand uh, in the wrong way. And these are, I guess, ordinary hardworking people. There was a huge amount of uh, exposure in the Daily Mail and, and a lot of other sort of programs that people who took out payday loans were feckless chavs on Benefit Street. Um, <laughs> um, and, that, and that's still kind of the, a lot of the perception, but in actual fact, when you look at the data, these are genuinely hardworking people. A lot of them are overemployed, so they actually have multiple jobs. A lot of them work in the public sector, they're nurses, they work in the army. Um, they work in retail, so a lot of zero hours contracts people in there. Tesco is probably our single biggest employer in terms of people who borrow from Wonga. But we're heading straight into this massive societal debate in terms of is Wonga exploiting these people or are these people actually you know, underpaid? Uh, and it's a clearly a very, very sensitive issue, which is one that we decided that we don't want to tackle that right now. Um, <laughs> but but it's, you know, you're uncovering some fairly significant uh, kind of societal issues. Do you, um 
do you have people who consistently uh, borrow from one month to the to the next? Yes. Yeah. What we find is that people tend to go through patterns in their life. So it's not about the broken down boiler, which the FCA would have you believe and require us to sort of only use those instances. Typically, what happens is people's income pattern changes. They'll they're in a shift pattern, and then that shift pattern changes, or something changes in their their lifestyle, uh, which means that they can't can't sort of afford things. And they'll go through a pattern in their life when things are very tight, and you'll see them going into sort of six or seven months where they borrow frequently, and then they'll kind of move out of that, or they'll they'll get into a, a worse situation. But yeah, typically they'll come in and borrow a number of times. Um, in terms of average average borrowing, typically it's about £226 average loan amount. They borrow for about 17 days and they'll pay about 30 quid in interest uh, for, for, that, for that loan. That's the sort of typical in terms of what, what happens in our base. It is super, super short-term borrowing. It's bridging the gap to payday to people who get to that point in the month. They can't afford, they've got nowhere else to turn. They've got, they certainly can't get credit cards in the way that you or I would consider. And so payday borrowing is probably the only place that they can realistically go. So all of that work was going on throughout 2014. As I say, we were off air entirely. We decided it was not appropriate for Wonga to be doing marketing until we'd sorted out the, the rest of the business. Uh, so we took off uh, about eight months. Um, at the beginning of 2015, the baton then passed to me in terms of, okay, well, how do we actually go back to market as a brand? What is the face that we want to put out there into, the, into that sort of wider society? And, and responsibility is, I guess, the buzzword. You know, that was what we wanted to convey, which was we were taking this very seriously. We were a changed organisation and we wanted to get uh, that across to people. But we were very kind of clear that um, regardless of what we did as an organisation, there was this kind of eclipse out there for most consumers that um, regardless of what we did, there was still a whole bunch of other payday lenders that were doing all sorts of other um, dodgy stuff and frankly we were always going to get tired with that, with that brush. And it would be very difficult for any consumers to see Wonga in a, in a new and changed light unless they saw the whole category in a, in a new and changed light. And Wonga, as I guess the by far the biggest brand in the sector, we figured that it was, it was going to be up to us to lead the category to redemption. So we needed to do some big uh, and bold things that would make people think very differently about the whole category uh, rather than just Wonga uh, as a business. Which, as you know, uh, as marketeers, is both incredibly expensive and very difficult to do. You're not just selling product. We're trying to shift perceptions and to kind of grow uh, and transform a category. I guess the way that we boil that down is that we're not going to make that change just through communications alone. This has to be real, tangible, demonstrable change uh, in terms of the way we deliver our product, the customer experiences that we deliver, and the marketing communications are ultimately just the, the manifestation of that at the end. It has to, be, has to be real change. And we felt that the only way of doing this was to address head-on the real sort of key perception, negative perception issues uh, in the market. So first of all, it, what, what happened was that most people kind of got the sense that payday lending, short-term lending, was, was putting people into this negative spiral. So it was lending to the wrong people with no credit checks whatsoever. Um, it wasn't then making the implications of that clear. Um, there was very, very high cost attached to it. And then it was putting people into a situation of kind of spiraling debt and repeat purchase and all that kind of stuff. So we had to do some stuff and put some very tangible changes in uh, that would address those points kind of head on. As I say, first of all, from a lending perspective, we entirely changed our lending criteria. We then offer customers the ability to say, well, we're only prepared to lend you this amount rather than the amount that you might like. Um, so we're trying to sort of give you a more personalized sense of what's the right amount of borrowing for you. Um, obviously, a, a huge impact in terms of the number of people that are then being rejected from the business. Um, we then made uh, a much bigger sense of making sure that the, the warnings were, were much sort of clearer. So we put all of our costs entirely up front. So if you use the sliders, it tells you exactly how much the loan is going to cost. It also tells you what uh, what is it going to cost if it goes wrong. So those added fees and charges are not hidden in the small print. They're on the home page right underneath the sliders, so you can't miss them. Um, we also introduced things like money back guarantees. So we know that people feel a bit guilty sometimes when they come in and they're taking out a paid loan give you 24 hours to pay that back immediately without any charges. We did a huge amount of work around reducing the fees. As I say, there was the price capping. We removed our transmission fees and we reduced our, our post-due uh, fees as well. And then from a spiraling perspective, as I say, we gave people a three-day grace period. So we know that most people actually pay back within three days of their post-due date. So let's give them three days grace <coughs> and buy any fees until uh, that, that three days, which was kind of a market-leading shout. 
Um, paying back earlier saving money, it was always a, a, a shout for longer, but you can pay back at any time without any further interest. Um, and we capped our post due uh, uh, interest as well. So to give people a sense that there wasn't going to be any further charges, so you could not, could not get into this kind of spiraling, the sense that it was suddenly going to turn from £100 into £3,000 out, that was never ever going to happen. Did you, sorry, did you find that people were, were taking out the loan specifically for, was it like bill payments or uh, was that, was it more kind of um, recreational usage? It's a whole, it's a whole range of stuff, okay. I think. Um, as I say, because, because of this, it tends to be a pattern that, that's taken them into that sort of cycle. It could be any one thing that they'll then use it, use it for. It could, be, it could be basic bills, you know, there are a group of people that will use it for their it's a young, it's a young group of people, so they'll use it for the pub on a Friday night. Um, we, we're not allowed to talk about that, but there is a substantial portion of people that didn't see that kind of borrowing pattern. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of different reasons. So typically, yeah, household bills, there's a lot of unexpected expenses, vets bills, those kind of things are, are quite common. As well. <coughs> so ultimately, by doing all of those things, we were effectively trying to pivot the business from one that was being seen as irresponsibly making money, and that's probably where everybody thought Wonder was, uh, into one that was responsibly lending money, and that was ultimately where we wanted to be seen. We wanted to be seen as a respected part of UK financial services. We also had to be mindful that we were talking to four different audiences as well with all of our communications, so it wasn't just enough to talk to our consumers. We had this kind of crazy job to do where we had to influence this kind of wider public because we'd lost legitimacy as a business to grow. We couldn't be seen to kind of grow and make profit again until we kind of convinced those stakeholders that we actually had the right to exist. So we were never going to actually change them into being customers because they would never be in the market for our products anyway. We just needed to move them from being overwhelmingly negative into just kind of a passive acceptance that we exist. Certainly then, getting into the more kind of commercial realms, there is a group of people who definitely fit within our target audience, but right now payday lending doesn't sit in their kind of list of possible credit options. Um, and we needed to try and change the perceptions around that. Our existing customers, you know, currently very, very positive, but what they weren't prepared to do was actually advocate longer um, in terms of using the advocacy as a, as a driver of growth, because there's still a secret shame around using a payday loan, so they wouldn't talk about it. Even though they had a great experience and it helped them out, they weren't prepared to then go on record and talk about that more widely. And then finally, our employees, our, our comms played a huge role in terms of bringing what was a very, very, uh, you know, a group of employees who'd gone through a very, very difficult time and also give them some sense of pride. The brand that they worked for also, uh, you know, was playing a positive role and they could go home and kind of hold their heads up high rather than, uh, you know, that whole kind of dinner party awkward conversation. And say, what do you do? And they say, well, I work for a well-known financial services organisation. Um, which, which, which I've done on occasion. So... <coughs> Moving more into the, um, getting back onto, back onto where we started off with a, a brand exercise, working with the board, we kind of got back to our core values, we did a piece of work around mission, vision, values, really sort of resetting the business to be clear about what it is that we wanted to stand for, a uh, big, uh, big uh, values piece that we then kind of rolled out across the entire organisation. So it's kind of taking brand and weaving it out all the way through the organisation into our contact centres. But really, uh, the proposition we came up with was around sort of credit for the real world. This is the acknowledgement that these are everyday, hard-working people um, who are trying to work to make ends meet, and that Wonga, if used correctly and if administered correctly, can be a very useful uh, product for them in, in those circumstances. It's about managing their cash flow uh, and putting them back into a better position, giving them some control uh, at a time when things are potentially quite out of control or can feel quite out of control for them. Um, and as long as we do that in a responsible and transparent way, then you know, we can be a legitimate part of, of UK financial services. So that was a sort of overarching, overarching problem. <coughs> we also had to be very careful about the way we went back to market. So at that time, we were facing, as advertisers, we were face, facing huge clamour for uh, the fact that our previous advertising platform appealed to children. So the puppets were seen very much as a, a vehicle to entice <coughs> younger groups into, into payday lending. Um, and we were, there was also a big cap uh, investigation around uh, post 9 pm watershed um, uh, ban. Um, what we did was implement a number of self imposed controls. So we uh, followed an approach 
uh, the sort of which the, the high fat salt and sugar industry do, which is effectively to index every single channel and every single program that we go on from a media perspective uh, over uh, anything uh, over an index of 120 in terms of under 18s that, that may see it is taken out of our list. So back in 2013, we were on about 170 on different TV channels. Post this, we were on about 70 that filled our criteria. Every month, we would then look at every single piece of programming that we would advertise on, and anything that went above that index, we would naturally strike it off. So we were self-imposing these rules to make sure that we were being squeaky clean in terms of ensuring that younger children could not see our advertising. Um, we also had bans around our outdoor to make sure that it wasn't near any sort of schools or colleges. Anything that could be seen to be causing offence, we were having to tread uh, incredibly carefully. And also then from a creative perspective, we had to move away from, as I say, something like the Wongies, which was seen as being quite fun and um, effectively just making light of the borrowing situation into something that was much more serious. Um, Alongside that, we entirely sort of refreshed, we did a, a bit of a logo refresh, we entirely refreshed all of our site, uh, mobile, and, um, and all of our sort of furniture from a, a branding perspective. We wanted it to feel fresher, we wanted it to feel more open, we wanted it to feel more transparent in line with the kind of values that we were, we were espousing. And then um, from, a, from a TV advert perspective, we then went back on air in May 2015. What are you responsible for? Persuading loads of Boshi teenagers to eat their greens. 23 tons and five foot of rubber. I'm responsible for doing the school run twice, daily. Making sure the pitch is fast and consistent throughout the season. Sterilising the things the dentist sticks in your mouth. Keeping sticky fingers off these. Best law. At Wonga, we're responsible for lending to thousands of hard-working people just like you. Wonga, credit for the real world. Are you ever late? I try not to be. Almost never. Well, not if I can help it. Nah, I'm always early. I'll well, try to be. No, not me. Never? Absolutely not. Never. Late. Not me. No. It's a bit rude, isn't it? Because you can't always be on time. Oh, no. Wonga now give you three days grace before applying a mispayment fee. Wonga. Credit for the real world. Now, I'll be the first to admit they are, you know, they are safe ads, and they were safe for a reason. We had some great concepts that we had to leave in the studio because they, they would just be too risky. It was too controversial. We had to do something that was clearly going to be very safe and, and just well received. Uh, but there were some common themes there that we wanted to land: responsibility, hardworking people, you know, us serving you in the right way, and then starting to bring those product features to the fore <coughs> in terms of us acting uh, in a different way as an organisation to really try and. Uh, continue that message. That was backed up in terms of press and outdoor, where we tried to um, really sort of land head on, as I say, those kind of big uh, sector issues and try and sort of answer those questions in a very direct format, uh, but just to kind of really get out there and talk about how we're acting differently as an organisation. So, alongside obviously with press ads and things there, did you do a lot of PR stuff with them alongside that help? Absolutely, we did a lot of PR, and I'll show you the benefit that that did. So at this time, we, we there's not many times when when you're launching a TV ad, I had to stand up and present in terms of every single financial journalist in the UK at, at that point to launch those ads, which was pretty scary. But what it did was it really turbocharged the message kind of getting through, which, which you kind of see in the results. So in terms of that first burst, did that did that kind of work? Um, and it started to. It definitely started to get some spontaneous acknowledgement that people starting to see that. You know, one was trying. So, you know, words like upfront, transparent, um, being responsible. I can see that they're trying to do things differently. I can see that they're trying to act in a more responsible way. So it really started to sow the seeds that, which is what we wanted. We knew we weren't going to change perceptions overnight, but it started to sow the seeds that Wonga was acting uh, in a different way and, in, and is a different organisation. If you see like, the word clouds that we used to have, you know, used to have kind of sharks would be the middle <laughs> kind of word in the middle. So it's nice to see that. You know, those, those kind of uh, comments are kind of moving on. And this is the PR point. So if you look at um, people that haven't seen any, any of our messaging, those that had seen sort of our multi-channel marketing, versus those that had seen that and the PR as well, in terms of their views around our commitment, our connection with Wonga and the momentum as an organization, the PR effect had a huge turbocharging benefit in terms of getting <coughs> those things together. So clearly, the role of marketing and PR there, hugely, hugely important. And then uh, at the end of 2015, we got uh, this kind of news, which was, which was nice, which was 
from the YouGov perspective, as I say, we were right at the bottom of that. So we were definitely starting from a very, very low base. But by the end of 2015, we were seen as the UK's second most improved, improved brand behind the co-op, which was another very damaged organisation. Um, but yeah, it started to work. We've still got a huge amount of work still to do at that point. Um, but we, we knew we were sort of heading in the right direction. So I guess coming out of 2015, uh, we kind of learned some valuable lessons. We we got back in the game. We'd been able to go back on TV. We'd been able to switch back on our marketing channels without causing too much fuss and too much kind of disgruntlement. And we'd started to change some of those perceptions quite positively. We got that improved brand. But what we were finding was that by doing that and being quite stakeholder focused, it wasn't having the commercial benefit for the organisation. So we could change our reputation, but we couldn't drive sales. So we had those two kind of conundrums in terms of what we wanted to do. And by being very responsible, we kind of lost our differentiation. So when you were a brand that stood out for being a bit of the rebel and being the differentiator, when suddenly you're acting in a very responsible way, we lost some of that differentiation that was also driving some of that appeal, um, which is a very difficult thing to manage. A lot of people saw our ads and thought we were Barclays. <laughs> a nightmare. Um, so, um, uh, quite a few learnings that we had to sort of take into, uh, take into 2016. So at the start of 2016, we felt like we'd made some progress, but we needed to think again about how do we kind of move forward for our next phase. Um, and what we wanted to do at the start of 2016 was really focus on, I guess, being a bit bolder, a bit more confident. We got back into the market, but now we felt like we could push it again a little bit further. Um, and we wanted to focus much more on the sort of emotional connection with our audience and what was really, really important to them. Um, and the key thing that comes through is that customers are incredibly stressed when they go through this process. They're short of money, they don't know how they're going to make ends meet, and it's a very stressful process. They come in to, to try and borrow money, they're not sure what happens if they get declined, what's the right option for them, is it going to leave an impact on their credit file, is it going to put them in a worse situation, what happens if they can't repay, what's the best what's the best option for them. It's a very sort of stressful journey that they're going through. And we wanted to kind of focus a little bit more on that. So customers, the overriding emotional driver for all of our customers is security. Wonga provides security for those people. I know that's, that might be hard for some people to kind of get their head around, but for those people in that situation, Wonga is a bastion for them. It's the place that they can turn and not be judged. Um, and it is something that sort of stands out for them. And that was the, the emotional driver that we really wanted to capitalize on. And by doing that, what we want to do is then uh, sort of draw, you know, develop our product set and our feature set to really then capitalize on that. So you know, we've got one month, three month, and, and further X month products uh, to, sort of to come. And what we want to do is to make sure that at any phase of your process, we've got product features that will really kind of help you uh, at, that, at that point in time. So whether it's your free application phase, eligibility checkers, um, helping you get approved, uh, all of those kind of things. A really sort of a set of features that we can really talk to as you go through that process to show that we understand the issues of stress and we're building product features that will really help alleviate that as, as you're going through. And the way that we ultimately decided to kind of turn this, uh, our brand platform for 2016 was around the thought of vulnerability. There was one term, one word that kind of brought together all of those, those both those product features, but also the sense and the feeling that one gives in terms of the security that it provides. And that led us on to our sort of next campaign and our next kind of bit of thinking. So we want Wonga in that kind of sometimes murky world of short-term lending. We want Wonga to stand out as a place that can turn with complete confidence. Um, we know that it's stressful. We understand that stress better than anybody else. And that's why our products come packed with all those features that can really help uh, alleviate that. So when you borrow from Wonga, you're not just getting money. You're getting Wonga ability, which is the thought that we have. Uh, kind of going forward. And we, this is what we hope will drive that emotional connection and is the one that we think will be our long-term platform to kind of see us as the, the number one sort of trusted provider in alternative lending.
It's good to have a bit of freedom, but sometimes we all need a helping hand getting over life's little obstacles. That's why we've introduced the three-month flexi loan, so you can repay in three manageable steps. That's Wongability. Like I say, a bit more tone, a bit more warmth, hopefully driving a bit more engagement and a bit, a bit more appeal around the brand. And as you can see, that has kind of really worked for us. So um, from, a, from a standout perspective, Puppet's you know, been running for three years and that was an incredibly well-known platform. So to get pretty close to that, we were, we were pretty pleased. We were certainly beating Paul and Partners uh, benchmarks. But most importantly, it's really starting to drive appeal. So, as I say, profits were actually driving down appeal. Responsibility didn't really do what we do what we wanted in terms of really making Wonga feel like an appealing place to, to go. Um, it had a big score in terms of uh, sort of driving and uh, making people feel better about Wonga, and also, most importantly for us, from a motivation perspective, in terms of driving active consideration, it was also outperforming all of our previous uh, previous work. Again, that sort of word cloud and those perceptions, just a complete transformation in terms of the way that people spontaneously talk about the brand. It's flexible, it's a good company, you know, people-centric, it's starting to have the right sort of uh, good words said about it. Big shifts in terms of our brand personality and our brand engagement score. So in terms of those not seeing anything and those seeing a multi-channel campaign, you can see from a brand personality perspective, huge gains in terms of those seeing our comms and their feeling towards us around transparency, trust, all of those kind of metrics and personality scores that we really, really wanted to move. And then, again, we had our sort of endorsement from, um, from YouGov midway through 2016, where we were now the top ranked uh, changing brand from a buzz perspective, uh, which is kind of a sense of momentum that that brand has um, in the financial services space. So uh, again, we started to kind of move just from being seen as a payday lender, but moving wider into that sort of uh, wider FS brand space. We also didn't have any ASA complaints, which was a, <laughs> which was brilliant. I, and I say that it was probably certainly in the sort of 2010 to 2013 period that it was a, it was a constant battle. Um, but all of that 2015 work and all of that 2016 work, we didn't get any any issues from any of that. And we spent a lot of time agonising over, over how to <coughs> interpret those new FCA comp rules uh, that apply to the payday sector. So there's a lot of time uh, that we agonised over, but was certainly well spent. I guess the ultimate accolade then is around what, about, what do our customers think, um, and we've certainly seen a, a, a much kind of significant increase in people actually willing to talk about us. As I said at the beginning, there was a secret shame around using Wonga and using payday lending, and now um, people are really sort of starting to, to change that. So people are really starting to use the language that we wanted, which was there when you need us. If you use it in the right way, it's a great tool, but you've got you know, you've got to be aware of how to use it properly. But you know, lifesaver. Um, I hate having to use Wonga because it means that I don't handle my finances very well, but when I do, the process is simple, the charges aren't that high, and it's saved me from expensive bar bank charges more than, more than once. It's, it's great kind of lines just coming directly from our customers, which is exactly what we wanted. So just to summarise, I guess, you know, we've come a long way in those three years. Um, we've learnt a lot. Um, the business has moved on significantly very, very different team of people in there managing it now, and I think we're starting to, to, to move on. Um, but the job is, is far from over. There are still some huge, huge challenges, both for the brand and the sector. Just to give you a sense, when I talked at the beginning, there was 800,000 payday loans in the market in any one month back in 2013. There are now about 150,000 payday loans in the market in the year, as we are now. So it's a much, much smaller pool of people um, which is a huge challenge isn't it, for any brand when, when your market is a fifth of, uh, of what it was before. And TV is proving very difficult for us to actually get it to work from an efficiency perspective. So this actually chart correlates our application volume and the TVRs that we were spending back uh, over that period of time. TV grew longer and TV grew the sector um, undoubtedly huge correlation. We had fantastic ROIs when we did all of our econometric analysis on TV. It was an amazingly strong performer for us. But come 2015 and 2016, it doesn't have anywhere near the same level of responsiveness. And maybe that's true of, uh, of other sectors. But we've got to look to other channels in order to get our other our brand message and our kind of sales channels out there. And from a share of voice perspective, um, 
the market's changed entirely. When we were out, you know, before in 2013 at 60% share of voice, and there was only a handful of competitors, there's now so many competitors, the market spend has doubled, and our market share, and our share of voice is now about 5%. So we've got to shout even more differentiated in what we do, and be even more distinct in what we do, just to be able to kind of get any cut through uh, in that. Which kind of leads us on, oh, before I say that. And then you've also got the people like Google, who are then entirely banning all payday advertising from a digital perspective. So you can't do some of the buffer line stuff, and also then from a digital perspective, you're also getting hugely compromised by Google deciding to ban uh, all payday PPC. And we can't do brand PPC, and we can't use uh, a double click for any, any list creation, um, which is um, makes life <coughs> difficult, even though we're a fully regulated FCA business. Um, I'm not bitter about that. Um, so our shift, I guess, moving into 2017 is to really think about how we use channels like Facebook um, and really sort of shift our model into one more around owned and earned media rather than around paid media. I'm sure that's a, a phenomenon that you're all kind of feeling at the moment, but we are, you know, we're, we're certainly having to make that shift extremely rapidly. So one of our next pillars, um, our next wave of vulnerability for, for, for the start of 2017, rather than it being a TV-focused activity, is actually a financial education program. It's financial education designed for our audience, which are 18 to uh, 35 year olds. 75% of all our applications start on a mobile device, so we need to be entirely mobile centric with this, with this program, and that's what we've built. It's uh, Facebook newsfeed esque in terms of content, it, it leverages all of our social platforms, it drives our SEO, uh, it provides us with CRM content, uh, and it also enables us to get a very different brand message out there, which is that longer. Uh, is a, a change business and one that wants to help people get out of their situation, not just be able to service them uh, for that one-off uh, one need. So that's the sort of next pillar in terms of what we're looking at in 2017. So um, that, is, that is it. It is a whistle-stop tour. Thank you very much for listening.